All right, thank you. This is Calling Functions Across Languages. I'm Richard Feldman. So something that I've experienced many times in my career is I'm working on a task within some project and I find myself saying, you know, this task would be a lot easier if I could use another language. Could be a bunch of reasons for this. A common one is I want a library that I know is in another language but not available in the language I'm using. Another would be I want more performance than I can get here. So I've got some particular use case that really needs to go super fast and the language I'm using, no matter how much I performance optimize my code, it just can't go fast enough. But I know there's other languages that have more tools that would let me go faster. Or the reverse of that, where I'm using a language that's got lots of tools for performance, but I don't actually need that much performance right now. What I really need is ergonomics and reliability, and being able to build stuff quickly. Um, also, sometimes I'm just transitioning languages and I want to do that incrementally. Like, I don't want to have to set up a whole new server or do a whole rewrite. I want to just be able to say, okay, I want to try out this new language a little bit, just one function at a time, please, and incrementally do that transition. So in the past, I've had different experiences with uh, calling functions across languages. Like, I used to write Scala in a past job, and if I wanted to call a Java function from Scala, that was super easy. There's just syntax for it. I'm just like, just import this Java thing and call it. It's no problem. It's very easy. Um, also, here's one that probably everyone here has done. Uh, I, in a previous job, was writing JavaScript, and I wanted to call Ruby, uh, and Ruby was on the server. So that was very easy. I just used good old HTTP, <laughs> called over the network, and hey, my, my Ruby function runs. Very nice. Um, here's one that uh, I, I'm guessing that nobody in this room has done. Uh, there was a popular Python package called NumPy, and does a bunch of linear algebra stuff, and some of the high-performance linear algebra routines that NumPy uses are written in Fortran. Uh, which is a programming language that came out in 1957. And so I assume that the way that they're doing that is not with special syntax but, or, or with HTTP, but rather with the sorcery. I, like how, do, how, this is a punch cards language. How do you, what? Um, but by the end of this talk, uh, you too will understand how they could possibly be doing this. And it's not actually sorcery as it turns out. I looked into it. Okay, so um, let's, in order to get there, let's start with some, some more familiar terrain. Let's start with the actual like HTTP, JavaScript going to Ruby, and then we'll build our way up to the much more high performance thing that NumPy is doing for Fortran, which we will reveal later how that works. Um, and we'll do this by sort of uh, implementing this dot product function. And we'll start by doing it in Ruby, and then, you know, we're not actually gonna write the implementation of dot product, that's like a linear algebra thing that, you know, Fortran has done already. Um, but let's say that we wanna get access to this function. It's a very nice, simple function. It takes two arrays of numbers and then returns a number, does some math on it, and I don't actually know what a dot product is, so I'm just assuming somebody else will implement that. But for our purposes, the relevant part is we wanna call it from a different programming language. We're gonna do this by just starting with the familiar thing JavaScript calling Ruby over HTTP, and we're gonna sort of peel back the layers of abstraction until we get all the way uh, where we wanna go. So let's start by peeling back the first layer of abstraction on just doing an HTTP request. We can break this down into two pieces, which we're gonna make explicit here in the code. Um, first, we build an HTTP request string, so that's easy, you know how to build strings, right? Uh, and then once we've got that string, we're going to send it to a socket, a TCP socket, and that's what's gonna actually cause that string to get sent over the network as bytes, and that's how we get our HTTP request done. So I'm gonna write this JavaScript code here that's gonna do those two steps. Uh, actual JavaScript in the browser, which is probably how most of us have done this <laughs> JavaScript calling Ruby functions thing, uh, doesn't let you work with TCP sockets, so I'm gonna use Node.js here. Um, but here's the thing that I'm gonna build up to. This is gonna be the actual HTTP request. This is the string that's gonna go across the wire. So it says get, and then we'll say slash dot product. We'll assume the Ruby server knows what slash dot product means. Then we say host. We're gonna use localhost here because we're trying to go faster than the network, and if we wanna go faster than an HTTP request over the network, step one, don't use the network. Because <laughs> that's gonna be a huge source of latency that's gonna make this whole thing way too slow. So we'll go to localhost, a bunch of boilerplate here about the stuff that's in the body, and then finally we have the actual payload. This is a JSON encoded series of arguments that we're gonna give to Ruby. So this is a JSON array of two arrays. First one is just one, two, three, four. Second one, five, six, seven, eight. Then Ruby server is going to uh, receive this. It's going to call dot product on those two arrays. So those are gonna be the two arguments to the Ruby code. And then Ruby's gonna send back a response, which is hopefully gonna say 200 okay. If it, wasn't able to do that, then maybe it'll give an error, but hopefully it can, it can make that happen for us. Um, then some more boilerplate, and then finally uh, 70, which turns out to be the answer, or at least that's what I looked up on the internet because I don't actually know what dot product does. So, <laughs> we, we, we've got our, our Ruby function. Hey, it's fine because somebody else wrote the function, right? Uh, we've got a Ruby function and it's calling dot product, it's returning that answer and it's sending that back to JavaScript and great, we successfully called a function in another programming language. All right, so these are the actual strings that we're building up. So let's look at the actual Node.js code that's gonna build up those strings and then uh, send the stuff out uh, across a socket. So Node.js, you can open a new socket like this. 
Um, say socket.connect, you give it a port, we'll pick port 3000, that's a common convention in Rails, uh, local host for the uh, URL, and then we're gonna build our request string here. Let's assume we have some function called build HTTP request, which says give me the path, okay, dot product, that's what Ruby needs to know to know which function to call. You know, headers, you know, who cares about them? Uh, and then the body will be, you know, json.stringify are two arrays that we want to give to Ruby. And then finally we just say socket.write and send that string to it. Cool, we have peeled back one layer of abstraction on HTTP requests. Um, next up, we have the Ruby side, so this is gonna deserialize those JSON payloads, that arguments uh, from the socket, and then actually run the function, and then serialize its answer back to the socket. So here's how you do that in Ruby, tcp server.new, again, localhost in 3000. I'm gonna do a little loop that says server.accept, so this is gonna keep getting bytes from the tcp socket. Uh, we're gonna make our, uh, sorry, get the request sort of in an object form by parsing that string that came out of the socket. And then we're gonna so call json.parse on the body portion of that request, kind of discard all the headers because we don't really care about them. Um, here we're gonna actually do the work that we wanna do. So everything up to this point has just been overhead. <laughs> so we can see there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of performance. Um, actually call dot product, get the answer, and then of course we have to turn that back into JSON, then build a response string out of that, and then finally send that back out the socket. Okay, so. Lots of overhead, but now we've made it explicit. We're no longer sort of behind this abstraction of, oh, it's an HTTP request. We can actually see all the different stuff that's making this so much slower. If you imagine trying to have NumPy implement all of this to do dot product, I don't think it would be a speed up, even if it's in Fortran. So, how do we make this better? Okay, well really, I mean, the first thing we can kind of see from our payloads, like there's a really big opportunity to make this better by just getting rid of all the stuff that we just throw away. I mean, th these are HTTP requests, there's all these headers and stuff, it's like, we, we don't care about any of that stuff. Well, here's what we care about. <laughs> here's the arguments, here's the return value. Why don't we just start there and just get rid of that stuff? So, okay, sure enough. So, here's our JavaScript code again. Um, basically what we wanna do is we wanna take out that big chunk of code in the middle that's building the actual HTTP request and just replace it with like, okay, our request string, that's just gonna be json.stringify the arguments, write that request string to the socket. Now, a quick note here, uh, this is hand-waving a little bit in the sense that we're connecting to localhost and since we don't have a path there anymore, this will only work if our Ruby server does exactly one thing, one function, which is uh, dot product, which is not a very useful Ruby server, but we could do it this way, this would eliminate the overhead, so let's just roll with it, even though in a real world scenario, probably we wanna have some metadata in our J JSON about like, hey, here's the actual thing I wanna run. Okay. On the Ruby side, again, we can sort of uh, take care, care, get rid of all the stuff that we're not receiving from JavaScript anymore, so we don't need to parse the HTTP request anymore, we don't need to build an HTTP response anymore, we can basically just do the, the JSON thing and uh, that, that's all we need to do. Now, when I look at these two, uh, json.parse and json.dump, this is another potential source of improvement because JSON, not the most compact format for representing a series of numbers, uh, we can do better with, instead of turning those numbers into strings and then sending those by just you know, sending the numbers. Um, so let's pretend we have some sort of binary encoding here that, you know, I'm gonna hand wave away, but you know, we can deserialize and ser serialize this. It's the same basic idea, but we're not literally using JSON. So, okay, that's another improvement there. Um, another one we can do is that now that we're just basically not using HTTP anymore, and we're just doing this over localhost anyway, we don't really need this to be a TCP server. Like, there's other types of sockets out there that we can use. For example, we could use a uh, Unix socket. This is like a, a local socket, so you notice like previously we said localhost and port 3000. Here we just basically give it a file, and this works as long as it's all on the same machine, and it's, it can be a lot faster than some of the other alternative ways. So this is an example of inter-process communication. So at this point, we're no longer really running a Ruby-like web server per se, which is fine. Um, we're basically just, we have a separate Ruby process, so we have our Node.js process and our Ruby process, and the two are communicating over this uh, Unix socket. Now there's a bunch of trade-offs when it comes to different ways to do inter-process communication like this. Um, I'm gonna just briefly kind of go through some of the, this uh, graph from this really cool paper about just they benchmarked and had some really good methodology around how they evaluated and uh, the, the speed of different inter-process communication strategies. So basically what this graph is showing is sort of the time between when the sender sends the data and when the recipient receives it. So that is like the Node.js process sending the process, how long end-to-end -end does it take before the, uh, the Ruby process gets it? And basically uh, the you know, TLDR here is that pipes, which are an alternative to sockets, are actually the fastest, so they're faster than any kind of socket you can use, Unix or, or TCP or whatever, um, for messages that are under 8K in size. So if you have, you know, like our two arrays way under eight kilobytes, um, pipes would definitely be a faster way that we could go with this, although once you get over bigger ones, uh, like 8, 8K and up, shared memory becomes a, a faster solution, although shared memory has the limitation that you can only use it if it's uh, between a child process and a parent process. So 
I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole of inter-process communication, but the point is you can do better than sockets in a, in a variety of ways. Okay, so to sum up kind of like what we started out with and, and where we've gotten to so far, uh, we started off serializing our JavaScript arrays to URL plus headers plus request body, had to do all that overhead. We sent that over the network to a Ruby server. Ruby had to deserialize the request, serialize that back to response headers and body, send that back to JavaScript, which then has to deserialize the response. And then we basically said, okay, well, what we can do is we can peel back a layer of abstraction uh, and say we're gonna talk over HTTP just to localhost, serialize those to TCP sockets, and then in the middle, we have this actual Ruby fu function runs, um, and then we kind of upgraded that to do inter-process communication over a, a non-TCP socket, and instead of JSON, we're using this sort of uh, hand-wavy binary encoding. So that should be faster, um, but what we really wanna get to is we really wanna do it in a single process. We, we wanna just say, here's my process, Start, I'm writing some JavaScript code. I want to call a Ruby function just exactly like as if it was a JavaScript function, or as close to that as we can get. None of this inter-process communication stuff, none of this serialized, deserialized, all that. Just go away. I just want to run this dot product function in Ruby from JavaScript. How do I do that? Okay. How, would, how do we do that? I mean, that's, that's a, <laughs> now we're kind of getting outside of the, the familiar territory. I mean, everything up to this point has been kind of peeling away one layer of abstraction, but now we're kind of like, okay, but, What's the thing we send the bytes to? How do we do this? Well, this is the fastest thing, so we're gonna have to figure it out. Um, well, turns out that uh, every process is basically a bunch of ones and zeros. So thanks, everybody. This has been my talk, and I'm out. Uh, <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's true. Like, they, they are a bunch of ones and zeros, but let's, let's get a little bit more specific about like, what those ones and zeros are actually doing. It's not magic. It's like, you, can, you, know, you, know, you know what they're actually doing. So here's an executable binary. Um, I made this binary by typing one and zero a bunch of times on my keyboard. <laughs> Um, so, I don't know what it does if you execute it. I wouldn't recommend executing it. Um, but if you want to, you could copy this onto your disk and mark it as executable and double click on it and see what happens. Um, probably you'll just get some sort of error and it'll crash. Um, but every executable binary is that. Hopefully they're more strategically placed ones and zeros. But at the end of the day, I mean, that's what's actually going on in, in any executable that you're running. Like the operating system, when you double click on it or run it from the command line, it's gonna take a bunch of ones and zeros, copy them into memory, and then execute them. So what does the execute them part actually mean? Well, let's just sort of hand wave away exactly what's going on there, and let's think about it. This is not literally what's happening, but let's think about it in terms of, what if instead of a bunch of ones and zeros, it was JSON, which we've already talked about, so I'll assume everyone's familiar with it. Um, and let's say we've got this JSON array, and the first entry in that array is just a string that says, add the next two entries in the, in the array and the next two entries are 42 and 123. So uh, what's gonna happen it, when the operating system is you know, executing this binary is that the CPU is gonna come along and say, oh, I see this instruction that says add the next two entries. Got it, next entry is 42, one after that is 123. Let's add those together and then that's my answer. What's the next instruction? Okay, it says add the next entry to the answer that we got from the previous step. Okay, next one's 200, so now we're doing 42 plus 123 plus 200, and that's our new answer. Then the next one says jump to the index in the, the next entry. So it's saying jump to index three. So what is that gonna do? Well, if we sort of number these array elements, so from zero to six, index three is gonna be this instruction right here. So this jump instruction is saying when we get here, just sort of go to, and this is actually what like original go to was like four, uh, it's mapping to this CPU instruction of jump, says like, okay, just go back to that instruction and keep, keep doing your thing, keep progressing as normal. So if we sort of walk through the steps that this is gonna do, we're gonna start with add the next two entries, that's our first instruction, and since the CPU knows, okay, we're looking at the next two entries, it's not gonna try and execute the next one, the next entry as an instruction, it's like, well, no, I'm gonna hop over those two, I'm gonna add them together, then I'm gonna proceed to the thing after that, which is this one, add the next entry to the answer, got it, hop over that one, jump to index three, and then it's gonna jump to index three, and it's gonna once again add the next entry to the answer, uh, which is gonna be another, another 200, so now we've got 42 plus 123 plus 200 plus 200 again, and then it's gonna jump to the index, and now we've made our first infinite loop. It's fantastic. Um, so this program will not, will not terminate because it's just gonna keep jumping back and forth uh, over and over again, which is one of many reasons that uh, GoTo has been sort of looked down on <laughs> over the years. Um, but this is essentially what's going on in a CPU. I mean, it's really just a bunch of instructions that look like this. It's not literally in JSON, <laughs> but conceptually, right? It's, it's the same kind of thing. But if it's not literally in JSON, like what actually literally is it? Well, basically, um, rather than having strings for these things, because that would be really inefficient in terms of like how much space it would take up to describe the instructions, basically the CPU's got like a hard-coded list. When I say hard-coded, I mean like hardware. 
Like it's actually on the chip. It's like, here is the number for add next two entries, it's five. When you see a five as the next thing, that means this is a add next two entries instruction. And then when you see a 17, that's add the next one to the answer. When you see a 29, I'm just making these numbers up. Um, you know, it's jump to index. Like literally on the CPU, it's got these, they're called op codes. They are uh, operation codes, they are integers that represent uh, here's what this actual instruction is, and then it's just gonna look at you know, the, the subsequent memory to figure out like the arguments to these, right? And it could be two arguments like this one, or one argument like this, or whatever. And that's also hard-coded into the opcodes. So these are sort of the lowest level primitives that you can get. It really doesn't get any more low level unless you wanna get into like, you know, hardware circuitry stuff, which is outside of my level of experience. Um, this is basically what's going on there. And then of course, you know, how do you get from here to ones and zeros? Well, these are just binary encoded. So, um, you know, five in binary is this, 42 in binary is this, the next one is that, 17 in binary is this, you know, yada, yada, yada. And so now you can kind of see how, okay, when you have all these ones and zeros, like, that's what's happening. Like, these are all just a bunch of opcodes followed by arguments and stuff like that. That's literally what's happening on your machine when you double click that executable binary. This is getting loaded into memory and then the CPU is like, cool, let's start here and we'll just go through and do the thing. There's also some like headers and metadata and stuff, but like fundamentally that's what execution means. All right, armed with this knowledge, how can we use this to call functions across languages? Well, let's suppose I've got my executable binary and I happen to know that a bunch of these ones and zeros represent JavaScript instructions and a bunch of the other ones, because I've sort of mashed them together into, into one executable, represent Ruby instructions. We can do that. And then let's suppose that I also know that this particular set of uh, ones and zeros happens to be a jump instruction. And you know, we saw previously you say jump and then you'd say where do we want to jump to and this particular jump instruction is instructed to jump into Ruby code. So when you get to this point, rather than continuing on in JavaScript land, it says hey actually I want to jump into Ruby land and then you know, Ruby will be instructed to jump back afterwards. Um, you can just do that. Uh, now, let's, let's sort of, you know, conceptually look, go back to our, our JSON model of the world here um, and say like, okay, we wanna do that. Here's the thing that can go wrong. So we have this add next two entries, right? This is an integer constant, 42. We're gonna add that to 123, sure. Um, this one's not an integer constant. It's a memory address. So if we mix these up and we said jump to index and we happen to put like 42 or integer constant in there, the CPU is not gonna give you an error that says like, oh, this is an integer constant. You, you're trying to jump to an integer constant. No, 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 that's, that's, that's a problem. No, it's just gonna be like 42, you got it, chief. All right, we're jumping to 42, whatever that is. Um, likewise, if you put a memory address in here, uh, instead of an integer constant, it's gonna add whatever that memory address is in binary to whatever your other number is. So the CPU does not have a type checker. It doesn't have like, a, oh, these, these next ones and zeros, I know what type they are and this is the wrong type. It's like, no, these are ones and zeros, Pfft, you got it. I'm gonna look at them, I'm gonna interpret them in a certain way and just, just go with it. Um, here's an example of where this might get us into trouble, specifically when calling Ruby from JavaScript. So let's pretend we have a CPU instruction that's like, the array length is the next entry. Actually, this would be a bunch of the CPU instructions, but let's pretend there's just one. So we're about to iterate over an array. Like we gave Ruby this array of integers and we want Ruby's gonna iterate over it. If I knew what dot product was, I would assume that they would be iterating over these numbers. Um, so the first thing you need to do when you're iterating is like get the length, so you know how far to iterate. So let's say that we've got the CPU instruction. It's like, okay, the array length is the next entry and the next entry is four because we had two arrays of length four, right? So far, so good. Well, here's our JavaScript code. JavaScript says, great, I'm going to, you know, in my JavaScript section of the binary, I'm gonna put the number four in that slot. Well, here's what four looks like in JavaScript. It's a zero, one, bunch of zeros, and then another one. Notice there are two ones in here, and they're all in the top row of zero, uh, ones and zeros there. Now, this is because uh, JavaScript represents numbers as floating point numbers. All like JavaScript numbers, like array lengths are just floating point numbers. Ruby, like most other programming languages, does not. Ruby represents uh, array lengths as integers. This is what it looks like in Ruby. So notice there are no ones in the top row, there's a single one in the last row and everything in the middle is all zeros. So these are incompatible. These are like different concepts in terms of you know, what the CPU sees of what the number four means. But like I said a second ago, the CPU does not know this is a JavaScript four or a Ruby four. It's just like, I don't know, I see ones and zeros, cool. I'll, I'll do whatever you want with those ones and zeros. So let's say I wrote, you know, I'm calling from JavaScript, I've got this JavaScript array, the length is in JavaScript flavored binary. It's this, the CPU comes along and sees this as the array length, that's the next entry. It's like, you got it. The problem is, now Ruby is seeing that. So the Ruby portion of our executable comes along and sees this thing, and Ruby doesn't know it came from JavaScript. It's just like, oh, these ones and zeros? Cool, I know ones and zeros, got it. 
What number do you think this is? I'll give you a hint, it's not four. Yeah, Ruby's like, oh, the length of your array is this. <laughs> you really want me to do a lot of iterating. All right, you got it, chief. So it's just gonna start going, and it's gonna go way past the fourth element, and it's not gonna stop. It's just gonna keep going and going and going until, A, enough bad things have happened that your program just explodes, <laughs> or more likely, you're just gonna try to access some memory that your process is not allowed to access, and you're gonna get a segmentation fault and crash. And it's not gonna give you a stack trace. It's just gonna say segmentation fault, and you're gonna stare at it and be like, what do I do now? I've been there. <laughs> so, uh, so this is, Kind of a, a clue as to why you know, more people don't do this. It's, it's, it's fraught. <laughs> you, can, you can really make a gigantic mess uh, by calling functions across languages if you make mistakes like this. Nevertheless, we are determined this is the fastest way to do it. We're going to do it. So how do we prevent this problem? Like we're in JavaScript. We want to jump into Ruby land, but we don't want Ruby to misinterpret <laughs> what our array looks like. Well, the answer is surprisingly straightforward, just like we translate before we jump. So before we jump, we're going to translate our JavaScript array into a Ruby array put that in the next memory slot, and then when we jump, Ruby's like, oh, it's an array, and, and it will correctly get the right number for the length and all the other stuff that we want. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, conceptually, we can break this down into three steps. So first, we're going to read the JavaScript-shaped bytes and then make some Ruby-shaped bytes. Now, you might say, how does JavaScript know how to make these Ruby-shaped bytes in memory? It doesn't, but we'll get there. Second, we're gonna jump to the Ruby instructions that will use those Ruby-shaped bytes. Good, Ruby reading Ruby, we like that. And then finally, Ruby needs to read the Ruby-shaped answer and then turn that into the JavaScript-shaped answer, because otherwise we're gonna have the same problem as soon as the function returns. And JavaScript's gonna misinterpret the Ruby-flavored array as, uh, you know, who knows, really bad stuff. Um, okay, so, but like I said, JavaScript is not so good at like doing this like raw memory stuff. But what we need is a language that can read arbitrary bytes and write other arbitrary bytes in memory, a language like, for example, C. C can do that, JavaScript can't, but C can. Now what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna painstakingly figure out exactly what bytes need to go where in JS and Ruby and write a bunch of C code that painstakingly pretends it's JavaScript and the other one pretends it's Ruby and they're like, no, 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 we don't wanna do that. Fortunately, we don't have to do that uh, because as it turns out, as is very common in a lot of languages, somebody else already did that. Uh, and it's the people who made Node.js, they have this thing that's a, a, basically a way to interact between C and Node.js. And it has, I've scrolled to this part of the documentation, functions to convert from C types to Node, and then also some functions to convert from Node to C. Now this doesn't quite get us what we want, because what we want is to go from Node to Ruby, not C. But if we can go from Node to and from C, and then Ruby also has the same thing that will go from C to Ruby or from Ruby to C, which it totally does, then, what we can do is, within the same process, we've got Node.js code running and Ruby code running, both of them can talk to and from C and convert their types into C types, and then, well, you know, once everything's in C, C can certainly talk to C. That's not even calling functions across languages, that's just calling functions. And now we've basically, by using C as an intermediary, found a way to, inside the same process, have Node.js call Ruby. So let's look at that. All right, so step one is we gotta actually implement the dot product in Ruby, so again, I don't actually know what that implementation is, but pretend there's an implementation there. Um, and then on the JS side, what we want to get to is we want to be able to call this dot product from Node.js, no sockets, no processes, no server, no HTTP, none of that, just literally import dot product from Ruby linear algebra thing and then call it. Console.log, here's my answer, just call that dot product function that we've imported, and we don't even know that Ruby's there except for this clue in the file name, it's just like, this is just an ordinary looking JavaScript function. We're gonna call it and then it's gonna give us our answer and we're gonna log that to the console. So, to get here, we're going to use C behind the scenes. So this thing says Ruby linear algebra, but actually it's gonna be implemented in C and it's gonna sort of delegate to this Ruby implementation along the way. All right, so let's do this. Implement bindings between Ruby and Node. Um, so first thing we're gonna do is, uh, don't worry if you don't know C, I'm gonna sort of <laughs> walk you through all this. Um, First thing is we need to include this node api.h. This is basically bringing into C. We're gonna say this is those bindings that I, saw, I showed you the documentation for. That way we can call functions that will do all of our conversions and we won't have to memorize byte layouts which we'll probably get wrong and cause huge problems anyway. Same thing with the Ruby side, so we're gonna need to include the Ruby bindings. So this is how we're gonna have our C intermediary know how to speak both node and Ruby. Then basically we're gonna define this function called dot product. I'm gonna use this convention here with apologies to uh, viewers who are colorblind, but uh, this is the most efficient way I can think of to do this. Um, the, when you see stuff that's in yellow, this is gonna be a JavaScript value. 
So we have this function called jo uh, dot product. This is written in C, but it's going to return a JavaScript shaped value, which uh, in node API.h, they call this NAPI underscore value. That's the, the type that it's returning, so a JavaScript value. Um, it takes two arguments, so the first is an environment. Worth noting, I'm not gonna really get into too much detail about this, but um, Node.js and Ruby both have stateful runtimes, like they have garbage collectors, there's like stuff going on, and so anytime you define a node function in C, you have to pass that sort of whole runtime environment in so that it can do stuff with it if it needs to, like it needs to make new allocations into the garbage collector or whatever else. Second argument is this uh, callback info thing. Basically, this is how Node passes in all of its like arguments, because JavaScript has various different ways that you can look at arguments. You're allowed to like iterate over them and all this fancy stuff that C doesn't necessarily have. Um, first line of the function is we're now switching into Ruby land, so this is color coded in red. So this value in all caps that is a Ruby value. So NAPI value is the JavaScript one, red is the Ruby one. We're calling this function from Ruby.h called Ruby array new. We're going to make two of these Ruby arrays. Both of these are initially empty. I'm not gonna show the code for populating them, because um, it's a lot of code. <laughs> Basically, have to iterate through both of the uh, JavaScript arrays that we got inside this info thing. Uh, for each of those integers, we're going to convert it into a Ruby integer, then push that onto the Ruby array. So I'm not gonna show all that, but we actually do need to do the integer conversion also for the return value, so I will show you that real quick, uh, so you can get a sense for like what this integer conversion process looks like. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna say Ruby answer equals RB fun call. This is not func all. This is fun call, so we're calling a function. I was confused by that the first time I read it. Um, and we're passing in this Ruby C object, which is kind of the Ruby runtime environment. Um, then we're calling RB intern on this string, which is basically like turn this C string into a Ruby string. So yes, even the string's gotta be converted. And this is just gonna be the name of the Ruby function that we wanna call, because Ruby does things very dynamically. You just give it strings of like the functions that you want, and it'll you know, look them up in a table somewhere. Um, we have to tell the number of arguments, because RB fun call, ah, I did it again. RB fun call uh, needs to know the number of arguments that we're giving it. And then of course we finally give it the actual like two arrays that we're doing. So this is basically calling the dot product function in Ruby. Now we're actually gonna be running the Ruby uh, code, telling it how many arguments we're giving it and then giving it those two arguments. So that gives us our answer, which is gonna be a Ruby integer. That's the, what this value thing is here. So now we've got a Ruby integer, but remember, <laughs> that is totally different as a bit pattern from the, uh, the JavaScript integer that we want to return. So how do we do that conversion? Basically, first we're gonna convert the Ruby integer into a C integer. So here's our C integer, so C int, uh, C in underscore answer equals, we call this num to int thing from Ruby.h, which magically turns our Ruby answer into an integer. And then because this is C, for some reason we have to cast it as an int. I'm not sure why that is, but you, know, you just do. <laughs> uh, and then we make our JavaScript answer, and this is gonna be where we convert from our C integer that we've now got into a JS number. The API for that is we call NAPI underscore create underscore int 32 give it that environment that we got passed in at the top, the C answer, the uh, reference to the JavaScript answer, so that basically means that this is gonna actually write into that thing, it's gonna mutate it. Um, and then finally we can return our JS answer. So the reason I didn't show you the whole for loop of like populating the two arrays is it's like, imagine doing all of this for every single element in <laughs> each of the arrays. It's like kind of a lot of work. So as you can see, this is kind of involved. Uh, there's, there's quite a lot to do this just to like call this one function that takes two arrays and returns a number. Um, so we're not doing JSON serialization. If you can imagine, like JSON serialization is gonna take even more work than all of this, especially when you need to like then send it to a socket, but it's not like this is trivial. It's not like we're you know, saving ourselves like a ton of effort necessarily. We're just doing something that's gonna be faster to run. Um, okay, so uh, to sum up what, what this whole C function is doing. So first, we're gonna convert our node arrays to Ruby arrays. So make two empty Ruby arrays, iterate over each of the node arrays, which has a bunch of numbers in them, for each number, we take that node number, convert it into a C integer, convert the C integer to Ruby integers, and finally push the Ruby integer onto Ruby array. Now we've got our two Ruby arrays, we can pass those into Ruby's dot product, convert its return Ruby integer into a C integer, convert that C integer to a node number, and return it. Whew. Okay. So, the payoff for all that is that now, when we do this import dot product from Ruby linear algebra, which remember is actually implemented in C, and we call this console.log, when we call this line of code in Node.js, what it's actually executing is that C stuff that we just wrote. That's exactly what it's doing. And because C is just, you know, bits in memory, whatever, everything that it does in there is shaped correctly in terms of ones and zeros. It knows that it's gonna like convert the arguments that it gets, these two things that we pass in, into Ruby-shaped things. It's gonna call that Ruby dot product up here, and then it's gonna return a Ruby integer, a uh, Ruby number, and convert that into JavaScript so that this answer gets printed properly. And we did it all in a single process, and it's gonna be really fast. Hooray! All right, now, 
so this works with like Node.js and Ruby, and as we saw, that's because of, you know, we have these like CFFI bindings. But now it's actually not such a stretch to imagine that you could do the same thing between, for example, Python and Ruby using the same C intermediary. Like as it turns out, Python also has a CFFI, which is short for a foreign function interface. It's got documentation, right? You can do that too. And believe it or not, so does Fortran. <laughs> it turns out Fortran also has a way to talk to C. So you can, using this same exact technique that we just learned, instead of going between JavaScript and Ruby, go between Python and Fortran. So yes, it took us a while to get there, but once you know this technique, you can actually use this to call between a lot of different languages, <laughs> uh, different combinations of languages, and it's gonna be a lot faster, believe it or not, than going over a socket in, in most cases. Um, and yeah, even though Fortran's from 1957, guess what, it was still ones and zeros back then. So <laughs> as, long, <laughs> as long as you know, you know what, what ones and zeros to put where, and that's what this C library takes care of for you, you're good. It'll still work. So it's a very powerful technique, even though it's a bit of a pain. Okay, so now let's talk about how to make it less of a pain. Because uh, as we've seen, it, you know, it, it's not sorcery, it's not sorcery, it's just C. But to be fair, you don't actually have to use C, you can kind of use anything that can like put ones and zeros in memory, so like Rust would totally work, or Zig, but you know, C is kind of more widely known, so I'm using it as an example for the talk. But totally you could do that um, if you wanted to in one of these other languages. Um, all right, now worth noting though, that in addition to this being a pain, we didn't quite get exactly where we wanted to go. Because what we really want is just JavaScript calling Ruby directly, not JavaScript calling C and then C you know, converting to Ruby. There's still a little bit of overhead there. Um, so could we get rid of that last bit of overhead? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, right, so this is like kind of an example of what we were doing. Like we had our C answer calling this num to int thing, which turned the Ruby answer into a C answer, then we called this thing to convert the C answer to a JavaScript answer. It would be nicer if we just had like a big Ruby thing that said like num2.js instead of C. But I mean, nobody implemented that. They could have, right? It's just, again, it's all just like ones and zeros in memory. You could say, I know how to go straight from Ruby ones and zeros to JavaScript ones and zeros. It's just nobody implemented that. It's kind of too special purpose. Somebody could, but nobody has. Um, so that is possible, even if that would be, believe it or not, even more painful than, <laughs> than what we actually did. Um, the best would be if we didn't actually have to do any conversion. If it just happened to be the case that JavaScript and Ruby just had exactly the same representation, like same ones and zeros, that'd be really convenient because then we don't have to do any work. I love that. Um, that would be also the fastest because then you just, there's no conversion whatsoever. So um, when you can get away with it, this is great, but you can't always get away with it. So an example is, let's say that I'm actually in Rust and I'm calling a C function. So Rust, as it turns out, has exactly the same representation for integers as C does. So you literally can just do this if you want. You can just be like, hey, I've got the C integer, bring it into Rust. Okay, done, no problem, no conversions, no nothing. What you cannot do is the same thing with strings. If you do this, you're gonna have a bad time. Also, fortunately, Rust is like kind of more strict about these things, so hopefully Rust would yell at you if you tried to do this. Um, you, you could actually make this mistake with the unsafe keyword, but basically, uh, this is gonna be a bad time because C uh, and Rust represent strings in their standard libraries in a different way, and so uh, just trying to assume that it's gonna be the same is not necessarily gonna work out great. Um, but really, from, from the ergonomics perspective, like this was not a pain. Like when I did this in Scala, I was just like import the Java thing and just call it, that was great because it just worked. I didn't need to write a bunch of C, I didn't need to do any of that stuff, and it was just fast. It was all the same process, it was, it was great. Um, but you can still have the same problem, even between two languages that are running in the same VM, in the same family of languages, because they can have different collection types, for example. So actually, Scala has an entire article on how to convert between Java and Scala collections in both directions. Because, yeah, conversions can happen even if you have this really simple, smooth uh, interface for doing it. That doesn't magically make the data structures be the same. Um, so this is definitely gonna be nicer ergonomics than writing C, and also much more explosion prone, or much less explosion prone, uh, because you're not having to do all this like manual memory stuff where if you get something wrong, you might just get something that iterates over an array a bajillion times. So definitely this is something better to aspire to. And, and if you can get it, you know, we can sort of see more specifically now why this is so nice. It's not just that you know, it's the ergonomics, but it's also a lot safer. Um, worth noting a, a quick note is that, so what we did here is JavaScript to C data structures to Ruby, if we'd run it to do a bunch of this, like we were calling a bunch of different Ruby, uh, Ruby programs with a lot of different shapes of arguments, we'd have to do all those conversions every time. A trick you can do if you don't need quite that much performance is you can do an intermediate format like JSON, for example. So take your JavaScript arguments, convert them into JSON, give that JSON to C, then C says, okay, I'm just gonna pass that JSON straight along to Ruby, which knows how to decode JSON. 
and now you're good. So now you don't have to convert like every single integer, every single array. You can just be like, I'm just gonna write a little bit of C code that knows how to take JavaScript from one language and pass it along to the other language, and that's it, and now I'm good. And you do have the extra overhead of JavaScript, so we're kind of like moving back one, uh, one step, but it means you get to write way less C code to do this. So it's gonna be a little bit slower, so if you really need that performance, this is maybe not what you want, but it's a nice technique to know. And you don't have to use JSON, you can use anything that both languages support. So a little bit of reintroduction of serialization can potentially make your life easier if you're trying to do this. Well, the nice thing about the, uh, the Scala the Java thing that we haven't talked about yet is that it was type checked. So if I tried to call the Java function and you know it, it had the wrong type or something like that, I would find out about it right away. Um, and when we're going you know between JavaScript and C and Ruby, it's just not type checked at all. Um, now JavaScript does have a type checker that you can add called TypeScript. You may have heard of it. Um, some might say it's becoming more popular than JavaScript. Uh, so let's say we were doing that, we could add TypeScript types on the JavaScript side and Sorbet types on the Ruby side. But the thing is, that doesn't actually cause this intermediate C code that we wrote to be aware of that. Like the C code is just totally separate from this. It's just like ones and zeros, hooray. Like it has no relation to TypeScript. It has no relation to Sorbet. It doesn't know about them. It really can't leverage those type definitions to do anything useful. It can't even tell, for example, if there was some aspect of JavaScript and Ruby that did have the same in-memory representation. If we knew the types, we could say, yeah, we'll just cast that. We don't need to go check its type at runtime or anything. We can't even do that because the C binding is just completely unaware of what the types are. Now this is not always uh, the case. So for example, if you have Rust code and you're calling C++, there's this really cool tool called Rust BindGen. And basically what it does is it will generate Rust type definitions and bindings from C or C++ type definitions. So if you give Rust BindGen, you say like, here's my C++ header files, it has all my type definitions in it, it'll just, this, this command line tool will just spit out a bunch of Rust bindings to that as directly as possible with like minimal conversions, like yeah, there's like the strings are incompatible, but we'll, so we'll convert those for you, but we won't have to uh, you know, go through and write all this stuff by hand. And also, if there is something where they are the same, like these integers, we won't even do the conversion. So it just knows all about that. And everything will be type checked. So it'll be type checked on the Rust side, it'll be type checked on the C++ side. That's awesome. That's like basically your one CLI tool away from getting this same kind of experience um, that you get in the like Scala to Java. So there is an extra step of like actually having to run this CLI tool to generate them, but once you ran it, you're good. Now you can actually just call your C++ functions and yeah, you have to regenerate it every time the, you know, the interface has changed, but, but that's it. Um, so I've been working on this programming language called uh, Rock. So it's at rocklang.org if you wanna learn more about it. But um, this is, uh, and, and thanks to Jamie, by the way, for the shout out in this morning's talk. <laughs> if you saw Jamie's talk, he brought up Rock. Um, and uh, basically, without getting into too many details, so Rock is a fast, friendly, functional language, or at least it aspires to be. It's still kind of a work in progress, not like you know, far away from 1.0 at this point. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that we really strive to make Rock awesome at is being really nice to call from other languages. So let me give you an example of how we're doing that. Um, so let's say that I have Rust, and rather than calling C++, I wanna call a Rock function. So instead of having like Rust bind gen, we actually have this functionality built right into the Rock CLI. So you say Rock glue, and then you give it a rock file. So in this case, rock to rust dot rock, and this is gonna be a rock file that specifies how to, given the types in your rock program, spit out some other languages bindings, in this case, rust. So basically, this is a way that you can use your rock code's types to generate rust types and bindings, similar to what rust bind gen does for uh, C++, but kind of in the other direction, um, where we're, we're starting with the, the rock types as the source of truth, um, and we're using the rock CLI rather than this third party thing uh, on the rust side. So here's an example of what that rock to rust file would look like. We actually do have um, <laughs> rock to rust bindings because rock's compiler is written in rust, so we actually use that for, <laughs> for rock glue itself. We had to kind of bootstrap, it was interesting. Um, but basically you have this function called make glue. Uh, this, is in, this is rock code. And so the type of make glue is it's like give me a list of types. So the rock compiler will actually generate a list of types of your program. This is like a data structure that says like here's the types of your rock program. Boop, there you go. And you just implement something that returns either a list of files like to output well, so like, you know, Rust files that I'm generating, or a string, like an error message saying like, yeah, you know, here's what went wrong when I was trying to, to generate this thing. For some reason, I couldn't generate it. Um, here's an example of some of the code from this file. So we're basically just like walking over all the shapes of these types that we're getting in as an argument, um, and this file header thing, which don't worry about that. Uh, and then it's basically saying like, okay, when the type is a function, so we've encountered a rock function, here's what we do. Uh, otherwise, if it's a struct, here's what we do. If it's a Boolean, you know, there's further down, just yada yada, just pattern matching all the different types of things that can come up in a rock program. And all of these things are just spitting out Rust files. It's like, here's, here's the Rust code that would convert from Rust to rock. Now, importantly, 
the person who is writing this file needs to know Rust and needs to know Rock and how to convert between the two, but you don't necessarily. You just need to run Rock Glue <laughs> if you want to just call ro uh, Rock functions from your Rust code. You don't need to implement this. One person implements this, and now everybody gets it. Um, so let's say that we've implemented a dot product function in rock. So this is rock syntax for defining function. Pretend it returns an integer. Um, we call rock glue and pass in rock to rust dot rock. And then on the rust side, cool. We can just we just get in this dot rs file that uh, says, hey, here's a dot product function. It takes uh, an array of 64-bit integers and another one, and then returns a 64-bit integer. And then the implementation will actually call this rock dot product function. One of the cool things about this is that Rust functions require type annotations, but Rock functions don't. Rock actually has 100% type inference, so literally this would work. You could write this without any type annotations, and <laughs> Rock's type checker will figure out the types of this and then give them to Rock Glue, which can then be used to generate the type annotations on the Rust side, <laughs> even though there were no type annotations on the Rock side, and they'll all be lined up and be actually totally type safe. Um, pretty cool. So um, this is an example of if I had a Rust code base and I wanted to call Rock from that. Uh, but what if I wanted to uh, do the same thing, but from JavaScript? So going all the way back to our original example of calling Ruby from JavaScript, what if I want to do that from Rock 2? Um, well, now we can say Rock Glue, Rock to Node dot Rock, and somebody else, in this case me, uh, would be writing this, <laughs> uh, this Rock to Node thing. And basically, what the Rock to Node function is going to do, it's going to be that same function, make glue, takes the list of types, yada yada. And one thing that I want to point out that's kind of cool about this compared to Rust bind gen. Rust bind gen needs to, in order to support a new language, it has to go in and be able to like actually parse that whole language. Like the Rust bind gen needs to know about C syntax and C++ syntax and the types. It needs to be able to do like type checking on, on C and C++ in order to add support for like Node. If you want to do like a Rust bind gen approach to generating Node.js things, you need to not only know how to generate Node, but also how to parse JavaScript and how to like do TypeScript type checking or something like that. That's a, a lot more work, but Rock Glue takes all that out of it because it's integrated with the compiler. It's just like, here, here's the function. Here they are as an argument to your function. Go you know, do whatever you want to do. Um, so what's going to happen here when I run rock to node.rock is it's going to generate all this C code that we saw earlier, this like an API value, the dot product thing, the environment, the info, the whole implementation that instead of you know, converting to Ruby is now going to convert to rock. That'll all just get generated for you. You don't have to write it by hand, which is great because, again, that stuff's pretty error prone, and if you mess it up, you get giant explosions. Um, so now that you've got that, we can also have the same rock glue command, since it can produce a whole list of files, it can produce not just the implementation, but also the TypeScript types. And I actually have a, a demo in the, in the repo of like actually doing rock type safe interop between rock and Node.js TypeScript uh, with these TypeScript type definitions. So great, and again, you know, even though I didn't put any types on here, it can generate the TypeScript types because rock has type inference. And it just knows that like, oh, this is an array of numbers, this is an array of numbers, and it returns a number. Cool. So. Why am I out here writing uh, Node.js <laughs> uh, to, to TypeScript on Node.js calling rock? Well, there's actually a very practical reason I'm doing this, which is actually I just recently started a, uh, a new job, and we really want to try and get this sort of like type-checked experience that I had in a previous job going from Scala to Java in this new job where we have TypeScript and we actually want to start introducing rock to that code base. We want to get this same exact experience that I had modulo having to run rock glue in between where it's like, cool, I'm in my TypeScript code, I want to just import some rock code and have it be type checked, the same as it was in Scala, same process, as fast as possible, all that good stuff, all the ergonomics, all the speed, um, you know, same, same machine, same process, just I had to run this one extra command. And uh, the company, if you're wondering, by the way, is called Bender, and uh, the reason that we want to introduce rock and have, uh, you know, be able to call um, rock functions from TypeScript is that uh, we actually want to move our backend from TypeScript to rock which is very exciting because Vendor is a company that was recently valued at a billion dollars. Um, so it's really exciting to have a new programming language that's, you know, at this stage being adopted by a company that's that big. So this is like sort of one of my first jobs at the company is to like introduce it in this incremental way by calling functions across languages, which is why this has been on my mind so much. By the way, if that sounds interesting to you or if you'd like to work with a gigantic Elm code base on the front end, uh, check it out. We're <laughs> we have positions. Um, okay. so. We talked a lot about calling functions in a high-performance way. Let's kind of zoom all the way out and just talk about there are some other trade-offs to be considered here in these three different approaches, like going across the network, doing inter-process communication, and doing it within the same process. So 
one thing to consider about the network is like some of the drawbacks here, like machines are stateful. Um, they can go down, they can like be, uh, you know, like having, uh, running out of memory and stuff like that. Network errors can happen. You can get like bytes lost, uh, you know, along the way. You might have to retry stuff. Um, you can get timeouts. Um, deployment timings, if you have multiple machines, some of them might be running the wrong version of the thing. Interprocess communication, again, you have state across processes, like the you know, two processes might have some of the same problems that you're seeing across the network. Processes can go down, so you try to do interprocess communication, but the process isn't there. Like, that's a problem that doesn't happen when you're doing direct function calls. There's no such thing as like your current process like was down. <laughs> it's, just, it's either running or it's not. Um, but also, I mean, you do still have some of that, potentially that same stateful stuff when you're doing um, doing it in one process. Like we talked about that environment that you had to pass in, uh, like the Node.js environment or the Ruby runtime. Um, one of the other things that makes Rock nice for uh, calling functions across languages is that it doesn't have a stateful runtime. You don't actually have to do any like setup or like cache the, you know, the runtime or the garbage collection, none of that. Um, it does automatic reference counting and, and doesn't have a tracing garbage collector that has a state that you have to maintain. Um, having said that, Okay, we did establish that like this is the fastest way to do the actual function call, but there are some upsides to doing these other approaches. So, for example, we talked about how oftentimes what you end up doing is either C or like the equivalent of C to call these functions, and that's prone to gigantic explosions. So, if for example, you're writing a, an editor like VS Code, and you want to have, let's say for example, a bunch of language server extensions that are written in all sorts of languages, sometimes including literally C, and you wanna know that if those things do something bad and mess up memory and corrupt stuff or like crash and segmentation fault, it's not gonna take down your entire editor. So this is why, and they explain this on the blog post, like they, they actually chose to do inter-process communication for the language server protocol. That's where the server part comes in. So it's not like a remote server, although it can be, that's another benefit is if you wanna sort of upgrade it to the network, we saw like with a TCP socket, you can just be like, well, I had a local Unix socket, just flip it around, do the opposite of what we did earlier and say, now it's a TCP socket, cool, we can just send packets across to a remote machine. Um, but really one of the main motivations was just isolation, to have it like if one of these plugins crashes, we do not want it to take down the entire editor. If we've got the, the C language server that corrupts the memory of the process it's in because it was writing ones and zeros to the wrong place, we don't want that to cause these bug reports in VS Code itself. We would just want it to say like, nope, sorry, your, your extension crashed or your extension was misbehaving. Um, Quick note that's sort of out of scope for this talk, but like it is kind of cool to note that WebAssembly actually has a lot of these kind of same security benefits as inter-process communication. There's different performance trade-offs there, but um, worth noting that if you're considering going inter-process communication because you want that sort of isolation, WebAssembly is probably another good thing to look into. And finally, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that although, yes, in terms of latency and like calling the, the overhead of calling an individual um, function, same, the same process approach is the fastest, you can get a lot of more horsepower out of the network-based approach because now you can distribute it across a bunch of machines. So, okay, for dot product, we're probably not gonna get a lot of mileage out of that, but what if you were doing a dot product over not just like two arrays that'll fit in memory, but like gigabytes long arrays, you actually could get a faster end-to-end -end answer by potentially parallelizing that across more machines or at least running it on a server that's a lot more powerful than the machine you're running it on locally. So, there's trade-offs everywhere. Um, you know, th this is like, you know, we spent by time the most talking about this technique, but as you can see, it's not like this is always the right answer. There's potentially, you know, the right answer is one of these other techniques depending on what your use cases are. So, I started off talking about, you know, <laughs> I've run into many times in my career, this particular task that I'm doing would be a lot easier if I could use another language. Maybe I wanna reach for this library, maybe I want more performance, maybe I want more ergonomics, or as I'm planning to do at Vendor, we wanna incrementally transition from one language to another, now you know a lot more techniques <laughs> for, for addressing those use cases and calling functions across languages. Thanks very much. <laughs>